here we go. We're going to talk about the close today. Um, I, I forgot to put one slide in, so I need someone to do me a favor. Um, if someone asks about what time these times are, where we're talking about time today, all times are Eastern time. So if I could get, uh, this is Marlon speaking, by the way. If I can get somebody to volunteer to type in all times are Eastern times every time someone asks what time the time is, that would be great. And the other thing is I'm, I'm not a very good public speaker. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty bad, pretty anxious about it. And I tend to uh, get myself really wound up. I tend to talk really, really fast. I tend to forget to breathe. And uh, those things tend to uh, uh, affect the presentation. So if someone type calm if I need to calm down or breathe if you think I'm not breathing or slow if uh, I need to, to slow down to get the point across. Those would be uh, be great. Otherwise, in that too, in questions, if you could wait to the end for questions. Um, sound up. Let me see if I can give yourself some more, some more Scotty here. I'm up as high as I can. Uh, speak up. How about that? Is that better? Okay. All right. Excellent. Okay. So, and then questions, if you could just leave the questions at the end, because they really take me off, off track and uh, I'll spend as much time, I'll spend as much time with you as I can. I'll give you my cell phone number, uh, my email, and you can contact me. I want to talk about today is what's going on right now. It started about, uh, well, it started about uh, 45 minutes ago, 2.30. Um, but uh, really what I want to focus on is really the last hour of the uh, the market, what's going on between 3 o'clock and, and 4 o'clock. Um, and uh, uh, But first I want to see how smart the audience is. Now you know a little bit of something about me. Let's see. I can flip these slides. So let's play a little game of Jeopardy. So the first question is for $200. And uh, by the way, amongst all of, uh, some of my uh, list of things I'm not talented in, uh, writing pretty answers is very difficult. Uh, the largest liquid stock exchange in the world trading over 17,000 trillion worth of stock each year. Can I get an answer on that? In the form of a question, please. Richard, in the form of a question. Stock exchange. What is the NYSC? So I didn't get in the question, guys. Come on. There, Richard gets it. What is the NYSE? That is correct for $200. That's important because if you have a huge fund, you have a huge fund in your, you know, the California Pension Teachers Fund or whatever it is, and you have to move money in and out of markets, you want to pick markets that are, are liquid, um, and the New York Stock Exchange is uh, the most liquid stock market and equity market in the world. Breathe. Okay, let's do the next question. This is going to be, uh, that's the answer. So next question is for $400. When all market orders are filled and the market is closed on the NYSE, that's the answer. So what is the question? This happens when all the markets, what is 4 p.m. Richard? Excellent. So Richard's 600 so far. So 4 o'clock every night, the market is closed. And guess what? You know, we're talking about imbalances, but you know what happens at 4 o'clock? There's no more imbalances. If you put a market on close order, it's going to be filled for you, okay? Unless, um, unless you know your your market on close order takes it out of the threshold in the end and put a, a stop on it. So, for instance, today it's very important, right? Because we're down about 40 handles, so 40 points on the uh, S and P, probably about 400 or so, 300 plus on the uh, Dow. So, uh, you want to be able to guarantee that liquidity all the way into the close. Okay, so let's go. That was that one. Six hundred dollars. An order type that gets the closing price of on the NYSC. What order type will give you a, a closing price? That is an MOC order, right? Market on close. So market on close order you put, and at the end of the day, in the last minute of trading, actually, what happens is all the market on orders get, get matched and the closing price is set and everybody gets uh, taken care of on the market on close order. 
as a good. The time when all market on orders are frozen and the NYSE publishes their imbalances based on the market on close. Nope. That's when the market closes. When do all the market on order closes? Market on order get frozen. Anybody? Jay's got it. What is 3.45 p.m. Eastern time? By 3.45 p.m. Eastern time, before that, you can add and subtract from your market orders. After that, then it's uh, floor brokers and things like that playing with market orders to try and make sure that they got uh, the market going to be able to uh, close orderly. So 3.45 p.m. Okay. And now we're going to do Final Jeopardy answer. And it is Archibald Leach, Bernard Schwartz, and Lucille Lusser. Nobody who are porn stars, who are not porn stars. Yeah. Okay. I'll answer that one at the end of the, uh, see if someone comes up with it. Here we go. Here's the, here is, uh, here's the mechanics on the close. I, I love understanding the mechanics of the market and, and, and how orders get filled and everything else. And so actually preparing for this uh, presentation today, was really a, uh, 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 a great thing. So I found this great slide and this great picture here, which I lifted from ITG. Uh, and it shows, you know, kind of what happens from 7.30 in the morning and, uh, you know, the preparing all day for the uh, 4 o'clock close. Um, and what happens really, so this is not really on time scale because you're looking at uh, 7.30 to 2 is the first thing, right? So it's not linear. So really what happens at 2 o'clock is the floor brokers themselves, also the guys on the floor of the NYSC, they start to get what's called sneak peek imbalances. That's big imbalances that are coming in early. Uh, and, and that point of that is for them to facilitate trades on the other side, right? To, to you know, uh, California Teachers Pension Fund wants to sell a million shares of IBM. Oh, I know someone who wants to buy some IBM, and, you know, I'll bring them in, and we'll bring this, uh, we'll bring this market into a balance. So the floor brokers start to see sneak peeks so they can start uh, calling their clients and telling their clients a symbol by symbol basis. It's important to know the sneak peeks come in at symbol by symbol. So all they see is a, you know, IBM has a million share imbalance. They don't know, I don't think they know how many orders that is that, that, that is aggregated to make that, but they just know there's an imbalance that needs to be filled uh, going into the close. It's being advertised right now. And remember, those imbalances will be pulled out uh, any time between, between two, uh, Two o'clock when we first start to see them, and three forty-five when they get closed. Really, it starts warming up around three o'clock. Uh, is when the imbalances really start to uh, come in and move them. Working, I'm just looking right now to see what the imbalance is right now. Last time I looked, it is uh, not a very big imbalance. So here we are. We're down thirty-eight million in a sneak peek. And I'm looking at about 160 million to the uh, sell side uh, on the imbalance. And that's not very big. We look for uh, big numbers like a billion type numbers. So right now between uh, 2 o'clock and 3.45, we actually don't start looking on the MIM until 2.30. And it really doesn't get heated up till about 3 o'clock. Uh, we start to look at these aggregated uh, sneak peek imbalances, right? So we have people on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange that is accumulating these imbalances and uh, send them into a database. And we pull them out of the database. We aggregate them together and paint a picture of uh, uh, kind of a bias of what the uh, close is going to look like between now and 345. After 345, I'll tell you, the, the number I found in, in this, uh, doing some research too, is at 355 PM is the uh, when the flow brokers start to uh, get involved. So that's an important time. And 359.50 is the last time. So that 10 last, last 10 seconds, I said minutes, but it's actually the last 10 seconds, it's it. Everybody's off, and then the uh, computers are doing the uh, close within 10 seconds of the day. So the important thing to get off this slide really is, is that uh, the floor brokers get to see imbalances before everybody else. We get to 
how the floor brokers provide that data to us. We aggregate it and then we present it to you. At 3.45 p.m., the actual uh, orders are frozen at that point, and that's when the NYSC publishes their, their numbers for the imbalances going in for the last 15 minutes of the market. And the volume at the end of the day, people, you know, yeah, you guys murder on close, but in fact, the market on closed orders are pretty, pretty good. The institutional guys wouldn't use them um, if they didn't think that they could. You know, they're they're dumping big, big uh, blocks of stock. So, uh, um, you know, if they try to trade during the day, they'd be affecting the price. So they're waiting at the close where there's all kinds of liquidity. So you can see this chart here on the right is the percentage of the uh, day's volume, and you can see right at 3:45. 1% of the volume trades right there at uh, 345 and then as you get into the close you're doing about two and a half percent of the daily volume on a minute by minute basis so a lot of liquidity happening going into the close so what exactly is an imbalance well it's easy to understand right it's that there's too many people on one side of the trade somebody wants to get out of a position somebody desperately wants to get into position in big things and so uh, that is what an imbalance is. And so let's just take an example of a, uh, an imbalance, right? These are, these are obviously easy. Here's a, a seller imbalance. So trader A wants to uh, liquidate 100,000 shares of IBM. Trader B wants to sell 1,000 shares into the close. They both put market on close orders. So I have 101,000 shares to sell market on close. On the buy side, I have uh, C, D, and E traders. One wants to buy uh, 10, one wants to buy 25, and one wants to buy 15. Add those together, so I've got 50 on the buy side. So now I've got an imbalance going into the close, about, uh, oh, about 51,000 shares. Uh, so I've got to fill that. I've got to be able to close that uh, market. So now I'm going to issue, the NYSE will issue a, uh, imbalance notification to the floor traders and the floor traders will uh, take that information and start uh, finding buyers for the uh, for the sell imbalance. Does that all make sense? Take a pause and then I'll breathe. Oh, this is the first time through the slide, RB, thank you. Okay, so this happens on every single symbol on the New York Stock Exchange, right? Any of them can have a, uh, an imbalance. So who's doing these market on close or these murder on close orders, as some of you guys are saying? Everyone does them, right? I've done them before. You're tired and you just want to get out for the end of the day and you put the MOC order and you walk away and there you go. Um, but most of the big orders that get, get the imbalances, they're from funds. They're institutional traders. They're mutual funds retirement funds, union funds, anything that has a, a, a lot of money that they move in and out of the markets on a regular basis. And they're not day trading. They're not, these are long-term investment uh, funds. And they trade market on close orders in general. I don't know what that means. Okay. Hold the questions to the end. They trade uh, market on close orders in general because the price statistically is shown to be pretty good for them. Um, they can play games, they can pay a trader to trade them in and out, or they can just go ahead and let the, uh, uh, the market move and uh, take them out on the, uh, on the close. And why are, these, why are the uh, institutions trading? Why are they moving funds? There's usually two classifications of funds that are uh, going in and out of the market on the market and close orders. Sometimes they're inflows, right? So mutual funds, retirements, 401ks, more money has to be put to work. So there's inflows and cash being put into the market to, uh, to buy stocks. Sometimes there's outflows where people are removing money from their IRA, so the funds, so the mutual fund needs to raise money. Um, so there's outflows, so there's general liquidation or accumulation going into the market on close. But there's also rebalancing, which is really trading one asset class for another class. And, you know, you can think of rotation as being in, uh, uh, that way. Uh, today, for instance, we have 201 million on the buy side 
and 372 on the sell side. That's pretty close. So it's pretty balanced, and, and I can look at the sells and the buys, and they're all pretty well matched. So, so it's just kind of a rotational day-to-day -day on, uh, on the MIM. Another type of rebalancing, which does really well for us in the MIM, is um, when the bond funds, right? So the stock market does really great and has a great quarter run. These mutual funds that have kind of um, uh, algorithms to them that have rules to them, 50% uh, uh, stock, 50% uh, bonds, they have to be rebalanced, right? So you have to sell the stocks and, and buy the bonds, or you have to buy the bonds and sell the stocks. So you get a lot of rebalancing that happens, and they'll use uh, market on close orders to do the rebalancing. Uh, you see a lot of it during um, index restructuring and index rebalancing. When they add symbols or take symbols away from an index, you'll see a lot of uh, market on close orders around that time. And I just basically talked through this whole slide here. So rotating, uh, they're rebalancing and, and coming within the parameters of their funds, uh, are the reweighting based on the index, right? So you got all these index funds, right? The S&P index fund. Well, you know, it has to mimic the S&P 500. So if that gets reweighted or if that gets, uh, as it drops, uh, you need to liquidate those funds that are mimicking that uh, S&P 500 for you. Typically, what happens for us on the MIM between two, so I wanted to kind of talk about closing imbalances, what the imbalances are, where they come from, how do we get them, um, and now we're going to talk more specifically about our product itself. So the MIM itself begins looking for data between 2.30 and uh, 2.45 uh, in the afternoon. Uh, floor brokers are starting to get their messages. They get them as early as 2 o'clock. We talked about that. Um, it really doesn't start heating up until about 2.40, between 2.45 and 3 p.m. Eastern time. Um, our, our floor uh, traders in, on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange are getting these, these individual messages. So no one, no one has aggregated the data the way that we do. Okay, so we aggregate all these individual messages um, and put them in the database. And so we have people on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange doing that for us. They collect all that aggravated, aggravated, aggregated data, they uh, upload it into a database, and then we pull it continuously out of the database. Um, and it gets updated about every 15 seconds or so once we get running. So it's painting us an early picture of an indication of kind of what the sentiment is going into the close as far as the institutional tradings or the big traders. Are they, is there going to be extra pressure on the close? Is there a lot of sell? Is there going to be big time buy-in on the close, or is it just like, hmm, you know, it doesn't really care. And today's kind of a hmm day. So here we are down 37.25 on the ES contract, and the closing the balance is basically saying, ah, yeah, I don't think it's going to be a big move at the end. We take snapshots of the uh, imbalance. Every 10 minutes, we'll take a snapshot and sequence it and we record it and that's available to you guys anytime you want on the website. We'll show you where you can go to get that. At 345, the market on close orders are cemented by the NYSC. So now that's done, NYSC publishes their data to let us know what the imbalances are looking at in a general sense. Uh, and that's the number you always see, you know, 1 billion imbalance, 733 million imbalance. We'll talk about that a little bit, but uh, that happens at 345. But remember, we got data and, and, it, and kind of a clue of what that's going to look like as early as 2.45, an hour ahead of that, and really a pretty good idea starting around 3 o'clock. At 3.45 p.m., our data feed actually stops because the, uh, uh, the data feed to the uh, flow brokers stop at that point, and now we're kind of into the, uh, the closing game of the market. So the public really knows about closing and balances between 3.45 and Four o'clock. So a lot of times I get traders that, that will say, oh, you know, the closing and balance, it's like this huge closing and balance and the market's going up. Well, nobody knows there's a huge closing and balance. We know because we see it, but nobody else sees it. So the market's trading away, kind of not knowing that there's big imbalance. So it's not going to react. The market's not going to react at three o'clock necessarily to a, a large closing and balance. Now, that being said, it doesn't take much for the flow brokers to, uh, accumulate in their own mind, to kind of integrate in their own mind, 
when every single imbalance comes in and it's big and it's all on one side. Um, so you do tend to see when it is 90% to the sell side and you're in the billions, you do tend to see really early market action. So let's go, let's go to our meter here and talk a little bit about our meter. And Danny is, is talking about what we're doing right now, 152 million to sell. And I'll talk about my trading rules and how I trade the, uh, the minimum and I trade off of this meter here. So this is what our meter looks like. That number there, minus 66 million, is the overall imbalance. That's the difference between the buy side of the imbalances. That's all the imbalances that are shown to buy and all the imbalances shown to close. And that's their dollar volume, right? So I take the number of shares that's in the imbalance because they really advertise the shares in balance. It's a million shares that I need to come up with, not dollars. Um, we take the, the uh, shares and turn them back into dollars uh, based on the uh, last price. So you get the imbalance information that gets updated real time. And those are the uh, total dollar volume on the buy side and the sell side. So I tend to talk about ledger as if there's actual real ledger and there's a sell side of ledger and a buy side of ledger and they're all lined up. That's what you would have. So you can see that the overall balance is obviously the, uh, it's the buy minus the sell. And the other piece that you need to understand is the number of symbols that we have. And this is important to understand on all the imbalances. There is no, you know, people go crazy because it's like, you know, so-and-so says it's 700 billion and somebody else says it's a billion, 700 million, someone says it's a billion to sell. Sometimes when you get down to uh, really small numbers, it can be like, you know, 200 million to sell and then somebody will come out and say, well, I got an imbalance, I was just saw an imbalance that said 200 million to buy. And the difference is the universe of the symbols, okay? So we have picked a universe of symbols which closely correlates to the S&P 500. So that means when these symbols move in one direction, on the balance, the S&P 500 tends to move that way. Okay, so we have a subset of about 300 symbols that have been picked that we track. So the MIM imbalance numbers, the numbers we push and the numbers we, we show you are proprietary and they're only our numbers. So you can't relate them to the New York Stock Exchange imbalance numbers necessarily, except that you know that if we're big on the sell side, New York Stock Exchange is probably going to be big on the sell side too. There's S&P 500 imbalance numbers that are out. There's Dow imbalance numbers that are out. So uh, the numbers are uh, unique to the symbol set with which there are. Because remember, at f and, and also the time that they're taking, right? Because remember, at 4 o'clock, there is no more imbalance. So somewhere between 345, when the NYSE publishes that there's 250 million sell imbalance, to 4 o'clock, that $250 million uh, dollars is gone. It's been uh, totally paired off, and the market is uh, closed. Okay, so this is the symbol number. So you can see on our snapshot chart on the bottom, we take the symbol numbers, the number of symbols that are shown in the balance of our universe, and our universe stays the same uh, every day. Uh, there was 115 at the, on the first reading, 246 in the second, 246 symbols in the third, 248 and 250 symbols. So that's an important number too because we want to know on our ledger, so we've got a buy side of ledger and a sell side of ledger, and we want to know not just the dollar volume, but we want to know the symbol counts too. Are all the symbols on one side or are all the symbols on the other side? And they used to call our snapshots. We take them every 10 minutes. So now going to the, uh, uh, the meter itself, right? So the inner ring is a visual representation. This is yesterday's numbers. So yesterday's numbers were really right down the middle. So not a very, uh, not a very interesting mem. Today's a little bit better here. Now we're going to actually the sell side starting to pick up a little bit now. So now 18.30, let's say I was actually trading. I would try to get in here at 18.29, uh, maybe 18.29.50. on the sell side. Okay, so sorry, I got distracted. Uh, so the inside ring is the dollar volume bias and what it is. So you can see the sell side yesterday had 56% of the dollar in balance dollars. 56% of them were on the sell side. Uh, well, the symbols were actually split right down the middle. So we had 250 symbols, so 125 symbols that were 
cell symbols and 125 symbols that were by symbols. So the symbols were just uh, no bias at all really going into the uh, close yesterday. And remember, we see these, so to give you some idea of range, uh, the, the percentage numbers can go all the way to, uh, I think we've seen as high as 92, 93% kind of numbers, like in the 90s even. So that you know everybody wants out or everybody wants in. Those are good days. And you get maybe maybe one of those really good days per month. I get, for me and the way I trade, I get about five or six uh, good trades, good solid sim signals uh, per month. So the first thing is a dollar bias, how much of the dollar sides are biased one way or the other on the ledger. And then next, the outer ring and the number in the uh, below in the center. It says 50% there. That's the number of what the symbol bias looks like. And then I want to take a little side trip here on the snapshots, and then we'll go to my, what my trading rules are. I have 45 minutes left. Holy tamole. Okay, so snapshots. So every day we do these 10-minute snapshots, okay, and then we archive them on our database, on our uh, website. And that's the address there for the website if you want to go there and look at the snapshots. And I just want to make sure that you go through that because you need to understand uh, how this works. You need to do that by looking at the data and looking at how the markets moved uh, based on what the, uh, uh, what the meter was showing you. Okay, so you asked the question, what if I could trade the SPX cash? Because I can get quotes for the SPX cash, so we, we uh, use that as our benchmark. So what if I could trade the SPX cash? You can go into any day back to, I think, uh, July 1st. We have our snapshots up from last year is when we started uh, uh, providing the service. What if I could trade the SPX cash and I entered the market at 320? So that, oh, you know, the guy before me had like this thing and he could like draw. Ah, there you go. This thing do. Okay. So what if I edit at 320? And I exit, oh, it's going to do a different size. So I exit at 340 right here. So here's the line, the exit line, 340. Here's the entrance line, 320. Right. How much would I made? If you have not, you know, if you have not done a, a mileage chart, and we're losing that ability as we move to uh, Google Maps. Uh, that's how this works, okay? So yeah, if you as entered the market at 320, and you exited the market at 340, and you went long, you'd be happy puppy because you'd be up about two points. If you went short, the market went against you. What can you tell if you look at this chart about the snapshot yesterday? You can tell that the, uh, well, well, let's do this. So what was the best time to enter long on this day? So let's just see that. Uh, can anybody answer me? What was the best time, according to this chart, to enter for a long, and what would be the best time to have exited? Anyone? Richard. Is Richard still here? 32. I'm looking to see if you can read this chart. So what would be the best entry time and exit time if I wanted to go long yesterday into the close? I'm doing a horrible job teaching. 301. It's entry time. And the best exit time was 4 o'clock. Right at the close, right? So yesterday the market was up 5.6 points between uh, 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock, according to the snapshots. Um, the best short, and, and this happens in all the snapshots, it actually gets calculated for you, so the highlighted numbers are, are the uh, best longs and the best shorts on the day. So the best short is a, a three would have been a 320 entrance and a 330 exit, and that would have only got you point two. So it just tells you you didn't have much on the upside just today in that last hour. It was just uh, basically down and no real good uh, reverse bounces during the, uh, the last hour of the day.
so that's important to uh, to know because I want you guys all to do some studying on the uh, snapshots. Um, and also in the snapshots, you can see the first column. Well, the first column is the exit time. The second column is the dollar percentage. How much of the, of the uh, dollars were lined up on the seller or the buy side? Um, and then the uh, next one is the symbols. So how much of the symbols? So today, you know, we, we colored uh, 50 green for some reason, but uh, you know, we had kind of a divergence, right? So we had more positive symbols than we had negative symbols, but yet the dollar side was uh, stronger just a little bit yesterday. The next one is the uh, size of the imbalance. So it was a very small imbalance yesterday, 66.5 million for us on the MIM. And then it's the uh, calculation of the SPX and the difference of the SPX over the entry and the time. Okay. All that. And hopefully I got somebody that's following me. Um, so how do I personally trade? And first, I love the MIM, okay? They asked, you know, they showed me this MIM thing, and uh, they showed the data, and they said, can you, do you know how to figure out how to present the data? And I said, oh, this is, this is awesome. This is data nobody has. Um, so in May of last year, uh, I started getting access to the database and started writing some uh, JavaScript, some Node software to uh, uh, pull it up and then present it visually and everything. So I had the advantage of having about half of May uh, we launched in June, and then I had the advantage of being in June and just fell in love with it even more. And uh, over time, these have become my rules, okay? We, we, we don't sell them as a, as a trading, it's a trading tool, right? It's not a, uh, uh, it's not a trading system. It's just giving you uh, a view of how the imbalances are going. It's up to you to map that data onto the uh, market itself. And I've done that for myself, and this is what I use to uh, trade. And I'm a, I'm a coder first. I love to code. I'm a uh, engineer to build. I'm a trader third, and uh, it really fits into my uh, my lifestyle because I can come in at uh, three o'clock, quickly decide if I want to trade in that last hour, and uh, and make a trade or not make a trade. And like I said, I probably make about five uh, between five and seven trade a month um, using the, uh, the closing bounce meter. Okay, so so trigger A. So here's the three things I look for: A, B, and C have to be true in order for me to uh, enter into the trade. So the dollar bias itself has to be really biased. It has to be above 66% or below 66% for a sell side. Okay, the symbol count has to alignment with that. It also has to be above 66% or below 66%. Um, and trigger C is the overall imbalance has to be greater than uh, 200 million. Okay. So A, B, and C have to all be true. Now, I will do a 3 o'clock entry. You know, sometimes there's not enough symbols, you know, and I have to kind of figure that out how to get that in there, too, because I'd like to have at least, you know, 150 symbols in the, uh, up on the database before I enter. But sometimes you'll see, you know, there's like 70 symbols in at 3 o'clock, and every single one of them is the sell side, and they're all big. You can kind of extrapolate. But anyway, so my first entry time is at 3 o'clock if uh, all – three of those things are true. Uh, my next scaled in entry will be at 320 if they're all true and, and, and if the numbers have grown, right? So if the imbalance has gotten bigger uh, all the way, I would like to, I want to see that. Um, and then uh, 330 again, another, another entry. Uh, and again, as long as it's still continuing to be trending stronger in the direction of the, uh, of the imbalance. Um, and currently, I exit at uh, 4 o'clock at the close. And now, after doing some more studying, I decided that I'm going to, want to exit at 3.55 p.m. So I just want to be out five minutes before the close is up and uh, get out of that noise um, on the close. And uh, so these are my rules. I don't use stops. I use 3.55 as a stop or 4 o'clock p.m. as a stop. So I do have a stop. Bell's going to ring, and I'm going to be out. Um, you know, it, and and sometimes it sometimes it does run against you. Sometimes you're six, seven handles uh, in the direction, and 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 you make a trade, and maybe the trade's not going to be profitable. But it usually comes back at least one or two points away uh, to get you out of the with just a uh, small loss. I do about uh, six or seven trades a month. I said that, and um, I get. Uh, some months it's like 60%, some months it's 80, 85%.
I get between 10 and 30 points a, uh, a month per contract out of the uh, uh, out of the MIM for eating time. Oops, that didn't come across very well. Um, also, if you go up onto my uh, blog, onto the I, I, I write a blog entry every day on the MIM site. So if you go there, there's a continuous chart running on, on the trades for the month that meet my, uh, my trade criteria. And if you look at the snapshots, they're kind of colored biased in mine, right? So there's dark green and then there's a really bright green. Really bright green means it's above 66%. Um, so you, you can quickly go through the snapshots and see days where um, the MIM for me was, would be strong enough to take a trade. And then you can see when the red and the green number are on the numbers. You can see when the best entries and exits are during that time. And you'll see uh, 3 o'clock is really, really great. Uh, and uh, 3.20 is great. 3.30 is great. So here's, uh, there's been two signals so far that meet my criteria so far in April. And they came April 2nd and they came April 3rd. And both of them were long. Uh, and uh, the first one, 3 o'clock entry, gave you about two points. Um, and the second one uh, was about 2.71 points for the 3 o'clock entry. So 3 o'clock entries overall for April so far have yielded about 4.7 points. Um, the 3.20 entries was about 3.8, and then, then the, the 3.30 entrance not doing so well this month, uh, just up about 0.38. So that's so far what's triggered so far uh, this month. I will also leave, you know, you, 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 when you start writing rules, well, if you start coding, reading rules, you learn that there's all these other things, too. So if I lose a signal, I'm out. Okay, so if I'm in the trade and, and, and it's 66% and all of a sudden it goes back to 60%, um, I'll be, uh, I'll exit the trade and I'll get out of that trade. So these waited all the way through. You'll look back to... Um, uh, March trades, and you'll see that a lot of them got aborted in the middle of the, uh, the middle of the close, being hour. Okay, so let's go back before we talk about signing up and writing the MIM with us. Can you imagine being able to trade every day with me? Wouldn't that be great? Uh, anyway, so um, is there questions? SPF cash is just uh, uh, the index. That's how much the S&P would be worth if it was uh, in cash. We do have people that trade options uh, with it. Uh, we have people who trade options. We have a lot of people who trade the, I trade the ES. Um, we have people who trade the Dow. We have people who use it for, uh, some people just use it for positioning uh, whatever they have into the close, trying to figure out what the market bias is going to be um, going into the close. Like I said, I use it for ES. A lot of people use it for uh, use ETFs, options on ETFs, uh, whatever way you can uh, you can leverage. I used to be a uh, um, equities trader. I've been trading for about uh, twelve years now, probably. And uh, out of those twelve years, I would say eight, nine of them, probably nine of them, were uh, trading ETFs, options, and uh, Stocks, I went to uh, um, futures and traded futures, and I never looked back. I only had one symbol I had to worry about and think about. I never had to worry about a CEO being taken out in handcuffs um, unless it was my broker. Um, and it was, just, uh, it was just liberating for me to be able to focus more on trading and less on uh, symbols. And I'll trade uh, uh, between uh, six and, and uh, uh, two contracts, depending on, on what I get in. And I did not take a position. I, and I read, and I said, oh, look, we got up to the highs. And then I realized it was actually 340 when we were starting to see us get a uh, symbol. So looking at the charts today, it wasn't until 3. So if I don't get a sim signal, uh, by uh, 3.30, it's a it's scratch day. So today was a scratch day. 3.30, it was minus 64% on the symbol count and minus 75%. How does this work? 
64% on the dollars and minus 75% on the uh, on the uh, symbol count. So there wasn't a uh, the uh, dollar percentage didn't make it up high enough before uh, the last uh, the last entrance. But we are kind of come down. So we hit up uh, 1832 and a half. It looks like, and we're coming down to 1830 here. Oh, you know what? That's really great, Don, because that's a great question. Um, so here's the deal. The ends are always the best, right? So the end of the week, end of the month, end of the quarter are uh, uh, really best days. And it's because you can think about it, right? It's because that's when people are cycling things, right? So uh, the end of operation, uh, options expiration, uh, people who've got hedges and things like that, they want to unravel, they use market on closes for that. Um, so the ends are, are uh, always really great. We did a, a, a 10 handle trade on uh, uh, September, October, November, September, the end of September, I think it was, was a bond rebalancing. Stocks had done so great that all the bond, all the uh, mixed funds um, had to rebalance, right? So they had to take and sell stocks and, and that money wasn't going to go back into stocks. So sometimes you see these huge imbalances or these huge numbers in the buy and sell side that they tend to bounce each other out because they're just swapping things around. Um, but when you do a rebalancing for bond funds, um, our funds that contain bonds, it uh, uh, it's money out or money in. So it was a clear sailing day. There's nothing big about the day. The imbalance came in. We were like, oh, wow, look at this thing. And, and the next thing you know, um, the market just it lost all of its all of the air underneath its wings, and down it went. <laughs> Jay, you waited for a long time to find out the temperature in Fortune Struck stuff. Fifty degrees right now. Beautiful, clear skies. We are ice free in the pond. Life is getting back on track. But kids, we're going to end early unless there's more questions because there's not uh, a half an hour worth of talk left in me. So here's the thing about the imbalance is before I started trading the MIM, and the reason I like the MIM is first of all, it fits my lifestyle. Second of all, I feel like I got sneak peek information that nobody else has. Like I have a clue looking at the uh, uh, market. feel like like it adds to me a missing picture of what happens during the last hour. I mean, how many trades did I do, used to do, where I would make money going into the last hour and only to lose it in the last hour because the market took some radical twist or turn um, on me. And now I can see that. I can clearly see when um, that stuff is going to happen. So um, for all those reasons is uh, why I think it's, it's great to, do, to uh, have on your side of the market. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you guys the MIM. The MIM is $99 a month. So if you go to uh, the link that Morgan's going to type in. Oh, wow. It just pops up like that. So you access the menu. You sign up for $99. Okay, we don't do trials. Um, look, it's $99. Okay, uh, try it for a month. And if it doesn't do, if it if if it doesn't fit your 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 trading style, that's fine. But at least it will give you an underlying foundation of what's happening um, during the close and what the closing imbalances mean, and becomes intuitive part of uh, of what you do. Now I can look at the meter really quickly. In fact, I can start to even look at the mark and kind of guess uh, what's going on on the uh, on the MIM. The other thing about it is it kind of like a free trial too, because if you don't think it's great and you haven't really learned, you don't feel like you've learned anything, just call Danny up because Danny's going to give you your $99 back. But it's not worth us to do free trials. Um, we have to pay for the data feed whether you uh, are on free or not. Um, so rather than do that, we just ask that you do that. And if you really don't like it and you really feel like it was not worth the money, just ask and we'll, we'll give it back. Uh, no questions asked. Now here's the other thing that is fortuitous about this whole thing. And this is basically what I was same before. Oh yeah, this is this is true too. I never, I never on a 20 handle up day, a 200 Dow point up day, I never would join that trade in the last hour. In fact, I'd probably sit there trying to short it, right? Because it would be like, ah, oh, 
it's just going to get exhausted, and I would short into it and everything. And I would just sit there and watch by, sit there and watch it go up another 10 handles. That's totally changed for me now. Uh, the trend is definitely your friend. Uh, and when the trend comes and you come into uh, uh, the close and the MIM is favoring the trend, right? You've got another billion to buy coming into the close. You know who's going to get, uh, you know who's going to help push that 10 handles up? The previous me's that were shorting into, uh, into the close and now have to cover because guess what? they got to buy a billion more shares of a uh, billion more dollars worth of stock. Um, so I used to get my clipped all the time on that, uh, that kind of trade. So now you know it's up big. You know, when we were down there big today, um, and the MIM was not, was not shown anywhere near a billion. So we didn't really follow through here on the close to the uh, downside. So that's why it's the best $99 you, you'll ever pay. Even if you stay for a month, and we hope you stay longer, because um, it will add structure to that. And here's the other thing too, right? So starting next Thursday, a week from today, oh no, starting next Friday, a week from tomorrow, uh, Mr. Top Step's going to have their trading academy, their boot camp, which is an awesome thing, right? It's the entire week. You get to be in the Mr. Top Step room and you get to trade with the Mr. Top Step traders. And at 3 o'clock, I come in every day um, and I do my read on the MIM and I share whether I'm trading or not trading answer questions to what do I what do I see, what do I intuit out of out of the MIM and other people trade also too. So um, we're gonna waive that that entrance fee for that. So if you sign up today what you'll get in the uh, your email is you'll get a coupon code that allows you to be part of the Mr. Top Step boot camp. Absolutely free and you get to spend a uh, whole week next week listening to me remembering to breathe in the uh, in the mic. There's another slide that says 42 of 42, so it must be the, the grand. So own the close, take the ride for a month, and uh, uh, starting next Friday, we'll trade it together, and we'll uh, learn how the uh, close works. And that leaves me with 23 minutes and 55 seconds of answering in a really long-winded way about how clever I am picking that Jeopardy question and nobody uh, answered and nobody got it. Did anybody get that? that uh, uh, I, am I old? I, yeah, the answer to that is yes. Um, no, no. That was the question that Cliff Clavin, so his last name, answered on. Uh, hey, Marlon, um, can you hear me? Yeah, Cliff Clavin answered on uh, uh, Cheers. It's so a little bit of TV trivia. They're actually old-time movie stars. Someone had the uh, 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 Cary Grant, Lucia Ball, right? And that was the answer that. They were looking for uh, the been in Cliff Clavin's have not been in Cliff Clavin's house. OK, I'm not going to use that one again. First time through. Go ahead, Danny. Okay, I'm not sure. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great, great. Okay, anyways, listen, I just wanted to talk a couple of minutes about the market. So if you guys have time to stick around, you know, it's not just about the MIM, it's about the whole day itself. It's about learning about trading. It's about learning what's going on. Uh, you know, and if you guys want to stick around for a little bit and you say you do, I'll stick around and I'll talk about the markets. Anybody up for that? All right. All right. Let's do it, right? You know, listen, it, I, I want to thank everybody for sticking around. First of all, I, I'm, I'm always happy to do this kind of stuff. Um, you know, as you've seen throughout this year, we're, we're, we're not at all getting the same type of price action that we were last year. And I am going to talk a little bit about the MIM, but I kind of want to just kind of jog around a little bit. You know what I mean? Let's, let's talk. Let's get some feeling going here about, you know, what I always say on my Twitter is, your opinions matter. 
You know what I mean? You don't come in here to sit around and not ask and not get involved. You have to be involved. So anyways, let's talk a little bit about the MEM real quick. And I'm, I'm not going to, I think Marlon did a great job. He's, he's the guy that put this thing together. And what I want to explain is like any, any indicator out there, I think you guys will agree. There, there's, there's no one indicator that does it all every day. Unless you're an, you have an algorithmic system that picks money out of our pocket, retail traders' pockets, which I say all the time, you know, you're, you're, you're stuck with the things, that, the daily tools that you use and the daily tools that other people use. You know, and one of the things that I learned from Marty Schwartz when I first met him was that, you know, and again, I don't want to repeat myself if you guys have heard this before, but he called my trading desk on the Merck. We had the largest desk in the S&P 500's history, hands down. We did everybody's business. Tudor, Bacon, Kovner, Soros, GLG, Citadel. Um, you know, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch prop, Goldman prop, Sock Chen, Numora. You, you know, I, I can go on forever, all right? And back in the old days, that was great shit. That was the stuff that everybody lived and died for. When there was big orders going on in the S&P, my desk was banging them out. And you know what? And on the other side of that, we did all the UBS program trading business. Now, for those of you that don't know me, I, I'm doing this because I love what I do. At Mr. Top Step, I've owned this company for four years. I don't get paid. It's a very, it's a profitable company, but you know what? I feel that if I take money out of it and at the end of the month that there's not enough to pay the bills, then I've shortcutted the people that work for me. I don't do that stuff. I'm all about trying to help people. I'm always trying to try to stay a little bit in front of the, the most recent, you know, kind of what, the most recent patterns. I'm not like you guys. You know what I mean? If you're, if you were going to come to me for, uh, for a, a support and resistance level, I'd say don't do that. If you wanted to come to me and talk to me about price action in the S&P, I'd say call me up. If you want to talk about fair value and the difference between, if you want to talk about the difference between buy and sell levels in the S&P and how when the levels get cheap to the S&P and you know you're coming down to a critical support level and you know there's a bunch of sell stops in there, you know that they're going to be pounding away on those programs. That's what this is all about. That's exactly what we're reading in the paper. That's exactly what we're seeing on TV. Everybody's complaining about the algos. Well, at the end of the day, you know what? I'm not sure what to think about it. It costs our desk to come a total $8.2 million hit in the flash crash. We took $5.3 million of that. So if you don't think I've got something to say about it, I do. I think it's wrong. I think the practice is wrong. I think that the way this comes from, no, we got the uh, we got the trading floor on the on the on the broadcast. What you're hearing is the desk on the floor. We were one of the largest S&P options desk on the floor a long time ago. You know, when we moved from the Merc, the old Merck, our desk was by far the largest in S&P. According to Merck statistics, every month we beat out Solomon Brothers, we beat out Merrill Lynch, we beat out Goldman. Why? Because we weren't trading our own accounts. Here, let me see if I can. Let me see if I can turn that off, right? Hold on. Would it be better that I turn the floor off? Would you guys think, is that a better idea? Here, let me see if I can knock that out. Okay. There we go. But anyways, listen, let, let's get to the heart of it. What are we trying to accomplish here when, as traders? I think it's a really important question. Are you here to try to make, you know, a couple hundred bucks a day? Are you here to try to make a thousand a day? Are you trying to make two thousand a day? You know, what, what is your objective? And, and at the end of the day, what I've learned since I've left the trading floor is that, you know, I kind of lost a little bit. You know, on the trading floor, on the boards, I could see the last eight, last seven trades on the board. And next to it was the S&P cash. So all I had to do was just pay attention to the, pay attention to where fair value was trading. And if it was trading cheap to the S&P, I knew that they were closer to sell programs. If they were widened out a little bit, I knew that they were closer to buy programs. So that's what I followed. But anyways, what, what I think is important about what's going on here in, in 2000, you know, in 2014, is we're looking at a horse of a different color this year, okay? In 2013, we came shooting out of the gate. We had a couple, we had a couple of decent declines, but net net, you know what? We didn't have any really huge consecutive down days. We, you know, a, a big in the beginning of 2014 or 2013, excuse me, and I, I don't have all these stats in front of me, but I think it took almost four or five months into the year to get a, five, a consecutive five down days. And then it came to consecutive six days, so down six days. So we didn't have any of that last year. 
money ruled. As money went into, we were watching the MIM, money was coming in every day when the markets were trending higher, and I want to explain this, and Marlon knows this too. When you have a clear, decisive trend, and the S&P is trending higher, and let's say that the S&P pulls back a little bit late in the day, right before the imbalances start coming out. It's been firm all day, and all of a sudden you start to see, you start to see, you know, the, the MIM building up to the buy side, but the S&P is a little weak. Well, let's face it. I think Mr. Topstep's been on the forefront of, of MOCs and making it aware of, to, to retail traders. Now, obviously, we've dealt with a lot of institutions over the year, and I'm not sure how many of you guys know this, but Option Profit should know this. Option Profit, what are, what are, what are the big option desks, the big option market making desk on Wall Street do at 3 o'clock every day? And I'm not talking about a DC tent. Yeah, can you tell me what you options and profit? What do you what do you think they do? Come on, you you got an idea? I'll tell you what they do. They've got long and short books. Okay, when a when a when a when a trading desk like Bank of America or Merrill Lynch makes a price for a customer, they have what they call a long and short book. It has long exposure and a short exposure. So let's say option profit comes in and he says, he says, Danny, he goes, look at, I'm short gamma. He, he's got two, he's got two things that the futures are going up on the close, right? He's got two things that he can do. He's short gamma. He can either roll his option position up a little bit, or what can he do? He can buy futures. That's exactly what the three o'clock cash close is about. It's about, it's about either getting in, getting out, taking profits. You know, that's it's exactly leverage and hedging. Exactly right. So, anyways, what what we've learned about the MIM is that again, I'm going to be honest. You know, if for, for anybody to come out here and say, hey, I've got, a, I've got something that makes money every time, I'll tell you what, right now, if there's somebody in here that's got something that makes money every day, I'll give you a $100,000 account to start trading now, today. And I'll give you my email. It's danny at mrtopstep.com. I don't believe it. But that said, you know what? There's a lot of people that sell carpet out there that say it'll last forever. So anyways, what we're going to do is what we want to do is we want to talk about the MIM a little bit. Now, the MIM doesn't necessarily work every day. It needs to have big volume, and that's the way it was created. So around those around those pivotal pivotal times, at the end of a quarter, the last three days of a quarter, the first three days of a new quarter, the end of a month, the beginning of the month, a new month. Um, the let's see, what what are the other big times? Let's see, when whenever they do, um, whenever they do a whenever they do a revision in the S and P, they add or subtract a stock. It's it's big option expirations exactly, Chris Osborne. So what you're what you're doing is you're trying to you're trying to line up your view with what the cash close is telling you. Now, does the cash close always tell you the exact thing to do? No, but look, if the S and P is down, quad which is big, huge. That's when the whole thing's, you know, or rebalances, quarterly rebalances. You know what I mean? Those are the big times. That's when the big firms advertise what they've got to buy and sell. And you, you can kind of follow it. You'll see that the MIM will get much thicker. And what happens is on those big days, let's say the S&P is down. I'll reverse it. Let's say the S&P is down late in the day, just a little bit. It's been trending back and forth all day long. What I call something that is called back and fill. You know what back and fill is? That's where the S&P sells off and then makes a low, and then it kind of goes sideways for a little bit, maybe a day or two, and then, you know, you can see it popping back up. So anyways, what, what, what I found about the MIM is that it's a very, very good tool. It's a professional trader's tool, too. I want to explain something. It's not just doesn't go out to the, it doesn't just go out to the retail traders. A lot of prop trading firms use it. A lot of hedge funds are using it. And a lot of banks are using it. And what they use it for is multiple reasons. They may have a, they, they may have a, a customer that's on the buy side all the time, and they want to get an indication of what the close looks like before at 2 o'clock, because that data starts at 2 o'clock central time. There's nothing else like that in the world. Now, can you? how do you decipher it? Well, there's a lot of ways to decipher it, but the best way to do it is to take it, get it, and use it for a little bit. Don't trade off it right away. Watch it. Look at the nuances between the cash, the S&P, and the MIM itself. You'll get a reading, um, as well as bonds, et cetera. Well, I mean, you can use it, obviously, you know, the TLT trade and all that, but we're just talking stocks now. So anyways. 
what I've noticed is that if the S&P is kind of choppy, up and down, trading around, not really weak, but not really strong. We see a lot of those days, not like in the last couple of weeks, but you see a lot of days where you kind of have a directionless day. Late in the day, the S&P kind of starts dribbling down. And what happens, are you sharing your desktop? No. I mean, I can do this. You guys, look at I think Morgan knows I'm, a, I'm an honest guy. I'm not out to try to get any business from anybody if it's not done correctly. Today it's about trading pub. It's about their offer to you guys. But I think Morgan knows, and I'm a, I'm a legit guy. I work every, I work so hard, you guys, I can't even tell you. I get up at 5 in the morning. I go to bed at 10 o'clock every night. And the reason I do that is because I love the markets and I want to try to feel prepared. But anyways, what I've noticed about the MIM, the MIM's, the S and P is trending lower late in the day, right? And you don't really know, you don't really know if the MIM is going to be, um, you, you don't want, you don't really know if the S and P is going to sell off into the close or buy or, or go back up in the close. But there's really no, there's nothing that really, really sticks out. Thanks, Chris. There's nothing really that sticks out. So the MIM all of a sudden pops out at two o'clock, and it shows, you know, fifty-four percent to the. 54% buys, 35 million to buy. And then the next, and the S&P is still chopping around, right? You know, down tick, down tick. And all of a sudden, the next reading, MIM, 68% to buy, 75 million to buy. All of a sudden, the S&P starts to trickle up a little bit. We start going out on our Twitter. We start going out in our room. Looks to buy. All of a sudden, the S&P starts to uptick. All of a sudden, the next reading comes in at the MIM. Now it's 150 million to buy, and it's 78 percent to the buy side. Now the S&P is going up. Now I've seen this a thousand times, you guys. I love trading the MIM. In fact, I'll be honest with you. I, 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 this isn't an easy game. You know, I mean, I, I make money trading, but I, I have great trade ideas, and then when I go to put it to work, I, I screw it up. Like today, I sold the highs of the day. Uh, the S&P went three, four handles my way. I, I thought, you know what? I'm up money. I'm just going to put in a break-even stop. What happened? The S&P went up, traded into the high of the day again. I get stopped out. Boom, down almost 40 handles on the day. So anyways, no PPT? Yeah, the PPT is always going to be around. There, you know, look, we, if, if up, maybe something will change here. But I think that the, the, the real deal here is what happens is once the S&P gets everybody short, and they go down and they find a support level. You bring back all those bears. The bears just want to sell the S&P. They think it's going to zero. But they haven't figured out that the thing's up, you know, 180% and up 30% from last year and unchanged this year. Now, they may have a good chance of fighting back this year. But the, the, that said, let me go finish off the MIM. So the MIM continues to increase and the S&P goes up. I bought it because I thought it was because I thought the MIM was going to move up. I didn't think it was that weak. The futures start to rally. Now, my thing is, once I get two, three, four handles on a trade like that, I take half of them off right away. I take half off right away. Now I've got, now I've got a free look at the trade, and then, and then I let it ride. But what I've learned is, you know what? I, I kind of got to go with the pit bulls rule about getting in and getting out. And the getting in and getting out part is that you're not supposed to fall in love with your position. You know what? You're here to make money. And if the things go on your way, snap those profits. Take those profits. Because you know what, you end up making another trade where it goes against you, and when you don't, when you don't take those profits, then you end up taking a bad trade, and then you're then you're fighting up hill track. But the the mim and vice versa. If the if the if the mim is really strong, if the markets are really strong late in the day, and all of a sudden you start to see sell imbalances showing up, and the S and P starts to trickle down, and the imbalances start to add up more, you probably will, like we saw today. I showed, I showed you the $400 million for sale. The S&P was up at, what, 32 even. And once we popped that $400 million out for sale on Twitter, 17,000 people and everybody in our room got to see where that went. And what did the S&P do? It sold off four or five handles. That's what we want, right? I mean, we, we, do we, do we, you're a use, or is this a new subject? No, this is the mem. We're talking the mem. But we will talk other subjects. But at the end of the day, what the MIM is, is the MIM is a tool that will help you, guide you into the close. Is it going to be correct every day? I don't think so. But it will also have a lot to do with your, your trade selection. You know what I mean? If, you, if, you're, if you're there to 
try to really knock it out, you know, it may not happen that way. But if you sit back and you and, and you look at it, you study it a little bit, people in our room have nailed it down. And they, you know what? They don't talk about it a lot. They, I know that they're in there buying and selling and they're trading the MEM, and I love trading the MEM. I don't know, I don't always go with Marlon. I may go with my own thing, but I do know that Marlon's been very good with his trading on that. With what data accessible to you? Well, we do have you need to have the conviction to pull the trigger. That's right. Absolutely. Option profit. And uh, but anyways, listen. When I when I started <laughs> Marlon, Marlon, don't no, it's not a rescue, we're partners, Marlon. But anyways, look. I want to ask. I want to ask something to you guys. We got almost 400 people in here, and please do me a favor. Respond yes or no, why or no to this question. Do you think the S and P is going down this year? Do you think we're Do you think we're setting up for a crash? Is yes. Option profit right away. Steve. Yep. 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 Come on. Keep showing me. No. A lot more yeses than nos. Keep going. Keep going. Let's see it. Only a few nos here, guys. Only a few notes. Keep going. Come on. There's 400 people in here, guys. I mean, I'm doing a good thing by sticking around. Let's see it. No way, no way, no way, no way. Okay. Well, you know what? I think if we added this up, we, we would probably get more people saying, yes, that they think the markets are going to correct. And I, and I have to agree. Now, as we go into the, you know, that old thing about solid in May and walk away and the end of the best six months for stocks, I think that we're already feeling some of that volatility. Am I, do you guys feel that volatility? I mean, are, are we seeing it? When was the last time that we saw four, you know, a 42.8 handle down move? Or we've seen 15, you know, or we've seen four or five down 22 handle moves. Something's going on here, guys. This isn't this isn't the ordinary stuff that we see. Bust to full. Oh yeah, no doubt about it. So how do you take advantage of that? Now, personally. I'm a bull guy. I love the I love the long side. I like trading the long side. I love buying those. I love buying the falling knives. The, you know, but I will say one thing. When I started doing that earlier today, I quit right away. I got a couple win, winning trades, and I watched the S&P reverse against me. I broke. I got out of, at some small winners, and I thought, you know what? No more of this, because because I don't want to get. I don't want to fight these trend days when they're going down like this. They showed you all day exactly what they were doing. They never bounced. Yeah, the Yellen Bernanke, yeah, no doubt about it. The Yellen Bernanke correction, yeah. So here's the thing that I think. I think that it's okay to trade the long side of the S&P, buying breaks and selling rallies and all that. But I also think that option profit maybe could come up with a good cheap trade that we could all take that, that we'll, we'll be able to say, hey, you know what, I've got 15, 15 grand in my account. I want to risk a 1000 bucks. I want to buy some, I want to buy some, you know, or I want to sell some 16 quarter puts or I want to buy, you know, whatever, I, I, however you want to do it. I, I think there's a put, I think there's a put setup coming here. And I th and I was trying to price them last week and I've been talking about, it, but what I'm afraid about is kind of what happened today. Sell calls, really, that's the expensive way to go, isn't it? Um, and if you had, if you were going to come up with a selection, Option profit. What 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 call would you sell, and what would you risk? Rich bought the SQQQ fifty one puts in nine thirty five. Nice, very very nice, Richard. Bear spread. What kind of bear spread are you talking? I mean, show me some. But here here's what I here's what I think, you guys. I think we're all in the same boat together. I really do. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter if you're from the floor of the CME or you're from Toledo. We're all looking at the same stuff. What the, the you know the volumes go back and forth. Have you noticed how we, we can do? What was today's volume in the minute? Does anybody see it? I bet it was over two and a half million. Anybody see it? What we what we what we see is on the up days when the S and P starts to short cover, the mini does like 1.2, 1.4 million. When the S and P starts to tank, 1.8 million, 2.3. Thanks, Ronnie. Um, the, you know, 1.8 million, 2.2 million, 2.4 million. So obviously, there's a big, there, you know, everybody's waiting around to jump on the downside. Now, I, I think that that's, yes, distribution. But I think that that's prob probably why when everybody gets loaded up like that, you know, when the S&P starts moving down, if you're lucky, you sold it at a good price. 
But if you if you didn't sell it at a good price, you end up selling at a lower price, and generally that's where you that's where you make your mistake. So in a bigger picture, what happens is the S and P starts to move down. We make a new contract high up at eighteen ninety whatever ninety three, and the S and P starts to sell off a little bit. What happens? The bears come out of the woodwork every time the S and P starts to sell off. Five, ten, fifteen annuals. Oh, the world's coming to an end, right? Isn't that the way it goes? And then all of a sudden you get a, and then all of a sudden you get this big back and you know you make a, a a low, and then all of a sudden you back and fill a little bit, and then the thing goes ripping back up. Now the reason that the the volume is so big on the downside is exactly what Marlon was talking about. You got the you got the mutual funds, you got the hedge funds, you got the investment firms. They're all trying to hedge, and you know they call it a hedge, but really what they're doing is they're just selling the S and P. They don't give two shits about. It. They're long, they're naturally long stock, but you know what? This is a, they do hedge, but they love selling the S and P. And what they they've not figured out yet, and I don't know how they haven't figured it out yet, is that when the S and P goes down 30, 40, 50, 60 handles, and I asked I asked this I asked this to Paul Jones's partner. Well, in the 80, in the 80, 1987 crash, we were doing Tudor's business. And Tudor would go from his desk to my desk to a couple other desks, and he had a guy in the S&P pit that he was watching the order filler fill the orders because he thought he was getting ripped off all the time. And he was. He was. People were front-running his orders, either the broker in the pit or the guy in, you know, in the pit. The order filler's got 800 to sell, right? And old RBRB is standing in front of me, and I give old RB one kick is buy and then two kicks is sell. So I... I give I give a little RB a two kicks because I got 800 to sell, and then RB RB says I see him jump up and all of a sudden sells 100 across the pit. Boom! Right back in the old days, that was fifty thousand dollars a handle. Can you imagine that? Sell 100, 50 grand. All of a sudden, the guy in the pit says, "Sell 200 at seven half." Now RB has already sold 100 at eight, at eight even. Now I'm offered 200 at seven half. 50, 50, 50, 50, 200 done. Sell 207 even. Sold you 50, sell you 50, sell you 50, sell you 50. Got 400 done. Now, in the old days, what more capital would do is they'd pick me up, they'd go, here, sell 400, no, sell 800, and then sell 800 the hard way. And that meant I could offer the shit out of those S&Ps. So what I would do, as soon as I got one of those orders, I would pick up the UBS program trading line. And I, the guy on the other end would know as soon as I picked up. I was their main guy on the floor. As soon as I picked up, he knew exactly what I was doing. He could hear me going, hey, sell 200 down to 8 even. Or sell 200 down to 7 even. And all of a sudden, he'd go, hey, pay 680 and 500. All of a sudden, I'd say, sell 500 down to 680. Boom, all of a sudden, the cash would just go funk a dump. All right, so that's the same stuff that's going on now, but we just can't see it as well. And what that leaves us to is at a disadvantage to where the markets were back then to where they are now. But that said, this is a much more fair, it's a much fairer playing level. You know what I mean? The, the, the guy in the pit can't take advantage of your stops anymore. He can't see shit. He can't run run anything. Those guys are like, they're like deer in the headlights over there. I hate to say it. I, they're a lot of my friends, but I kind of think when I talk to them, they're kind of like lost, like uh, like boogie nights. You know what I mean? Like uh, they're, they're, they're still waiting for... The big party, the big sell-off. I mean, I go into the S and P pit, and I'm like, "Hey, what are you guys still doing here? You know, what do you, what do you, you know? There's very little paper in here. And one of the order fillers that's left is Brian Cooley, and I paid for his membership to get into the pit. And I'm like, "What are you guys waiting for? And I, you know, these are a couple of good, my good friends. I'm like, "Man, we're waiting for that big down day again. What? <laughs> what are you talking about waiting for that big down day? There's not going to be any paper in the S and P pit to sell. You're not going to get the edges. They're going to make you millions of dollars like in the 87 crash. Hold on one minute. 